After Capcom's Resident Evil became a surprise success in 1996, everybody wanted a piece of the survival horror pie, or perhaps the money that came from selling that pie. Yes, it was the money. Not sure why I mentioned pie at all, really. Without question, the most acclaimed and beloved pretender to Resident Evil's throne was Konami's 1999 smash hit, Silent Hill. Silent Hill borrowed a lot from Resident Evil in terms of its style and gameplay, but it stood out by bringing a unique perspective to the horror. Resident Evil did a great job of making you worry about what might lurk in the dark corners of your room, but Silent Hill made you worry about what might lurk in the dark corners of your mind. All of this is to say that Silent Hill is a game of spookums, but it's also a game of thinkums. It then adds a heaping load of stinkums into the mix as the series progresses, but we'll get to that. Unlike Resident Evil, however, Silent Hill's time in the sun was brief. Whereas the former is still going strong today, having reinvented itself successfully for several generations of audiences, Silent Hill failed to evolve. Though, as a number of entries on this list will demonstrate, it wasn't for lack of trying. We'll be looking at every game in the series today and ranking them from worst to best, but first, the rules. And a quick disclaimer. Firstly, because there were so few Silent Hill titles, we will be counting phone games. We are regretting this decision even as we're making it, but this would be an even shorter list without them, so apologies in advance. We will not count patchy slot games, however, because we still have our standards even if Konami doesn't. We also won't be counting later ports, remasters, or collections. Usually that's because later versions of games can be different enough, improved enough, or bigger enough that it only muddies the waters to consider them. In Silent Hill's case, though, it's because just about all of them are substantially worse. Way to go, everyone. That's about it for the rules, but I will make a point of saying that we will avoid spoilers to the best of our abilities. If there's a game on this list you'd like to seek out, fear not, we'll keep the major plot reveals to ourselves. There is one other thing to note about the content, however. Trigger warning for, well, everything. Any terrible thing that human beings can do or have done unto them happens regularly in Silent Hill. We will avoid speaking descriptively about those things, but please be warned that the game's visuals alone can often be upsetting. That's what they're designed to be, of course, but a warning is in effect for the duration of this video. Also, we will be making jokes about these games that's sort of our duty as emotionally stunted idiots on the internet. In doing so, we are not making light of the real-world seriousness of similar issues. We are appraising these games, and these games happen to contain objectionable behaviours. We do not mean to belittle or demean that impact, we just want to point our noses into the sky and say rude things about video games. Okay. Basically, the games are intense. Do you know who else was intense? Moses. He lived intense most of his life. <laughs> there. If you've decided not to watch any further, we've at least left you with the greatest joke in history. With all of that said, and with us already trembling in fear, let's rank them. I'm Ben. And I'm Peter Midhead. And this is ev every Silent Hill video game ranked from worst to best. But before we get to the list, we'd like to thank NordVPN for sponsoring this video. We use NordVPN all the time here at Triple Jump, and let's face it, if idiots like us can use it, then so can you. It's that easy. You can connect with a single click or enable auto-connect for zero-click protection. Then it's just a case of connecting to one of over 5,000 different servers, either one close to home, if you're just looking for the added security a VPN can provide, or perhaps one in a different country if you're wanting to access region-locked content. Now, you've probably heard of people doing that to watch TV shows or movies, but did you know that it also applies to the world of video games as well? You can access geo-restricted servers, region-specific games, and discount codes that are only available in other countries. And there's no need to worry about speeds either, as NordVPN is literally the fastest VPN service out there. So if you're being rinsed in Call of Duty by some 12-year-old from across the pond, you've nobody to blame but yourself. Get good. Gaming aside, NordVPN is also very handy for when you're browsing dodgy websites, which is especially useful for us on Worst Games Ever when we're looking for ISOs. Its smart ad blocking keeps your screen nice and clean, and its automatic kill switch feature can immediately terminate your connection if the VPN drops out. So why not grab your exclusive deal by heading to nordvpn.com forward slash triple jump to get a huge discount off your NordVPN plan, plus four additional months 
just for free. It's completely risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. You know, it makes sense. Should we go back to the list now? Let's go back to the list. Number 15. Play novel Silent Hill 2001. Game Boy Advance. Books and video games can both get deeply into the audience's minds. In books, that's because descriptions on a page literally require the reader's brain to do the work of assembling words into images, characters, and actions. In video games, you're performing the actions yourself. Well, not literally, thank God, especially in this series. But you do have some tactile responsibility for what happens, when, and how. Something like Silent Hill can work in either medium, but play novel Silent Hill attempts, to some degree, to work in both and it works in neither. Admittedly, the game never got an official English translation. We have fan translations, but if we're unable to judge the quality of the original writing, we can't really hold that against it. What we can hold against it is everything else. Play novel Silent Hill largely retells the story of Silent Hill in a choose-your-own-adventure-style campaign centered around Harry Mason. It then adds a second campaign starring kindly police officer Sybil Bennett. There was also a new character, Andy, who was introduced for a third campaign intended to be told across four chapters of DLC. Konami seems to have only ever released the first chapter, and that chapter now seems to be lost media. Here's hoping it surfaces at some point, if only so we can be disappointed by that as well. Visual novels are far more popular in Japan than they are in the West, so I am aware that I am not the target audience, but there's precious little visual content here. There are a few puzzles in the traditional sense, and usually your interaction is limited to picking an option from a list in which everything seems equally viable. There are a variety of endings, but obtaining them requires slot through the same text that failed to be engaging the first time. I understand, of course, that Silent Hill could not be ported to the GBA proper, but surely a different kind of Silent Hill game to suit the hardware would have been the wiser move. That might have also been rubbish, but at least we'd have gotten a game and not a PowerPoint presentation. Number 14. Silent Hill Mobile 2006. Mobile. Researching this one is a nightmare, as this three-part Silent Hill mobile game is completely distinct from another, more famous, three-part Silent Hill mobile game. And as if Silent Hill Mobile weren't a generic enough title to begin with, the other game, which we'll get to, was itself released as Silent Hill Mobile in Japan. Thankfully, it was called Orphan in the West, which is better on the grounds that it is a different word. And because people often refer to Silent Hill Orphan as Silent Hill Mobile, this one keeps getting buried deeper and deeper in the ground, which... Right, okay, that is where it belongs, but it's the principle of the thing, you know? And that's also why we can't show you footage of the game, as everything we found was mislabeled orphan footage. It's my own personal Silent Hill nightmare. Anyway, Silent Hill Mobile was released in three chapters, which are three parts of one story rather than one game and two sequels. And that story is the first Silent Hill game, sort of. Maybe? It's hard to tell, being as it's a game I can't play, can't read, and can barely research. Most of my information comes from this Famitsu report, which, well, I can't read that either, but the translation helps a lot. To quote the plot summary, The night road is suddenly, the flying is gone, the silhouette is gone, and the accident is wrong. Classic tale, really. It continues, At present, there is a deep fog, a bag, and a quiet taste. Which, uh... Right, this isn't going to get me anywhere. Poking around online, this seems like a retelling of Silent Hill as a point-and-click adventure game. There was also a rudimentary combat system. At least, I assume it was rudimentary. I have a difficult time imagining that it wouldn't have been. And looking at images of the characters and items from the game, it's safe to assume that some attempt was made to capture the interactions and puzzles of the original, but that's about all we know. This is a genuinely interesting footnote in Silent Hill history. I did my best with what little is out there, but I sincerely hope I can learn more about it later when someone manages to unearth it and document it properly. Number 13. Silent Hill The Escape 2008. Mobile. The Escape is by far the most technically impressive Silent Hill mobile game, but it's also far less of a Silent Hill game. In terms of design, it's closer to the first Doom, only with a far slower pace and gyroscope integration. The story is... well, you're looking at it. You play as someone. Who? Doesn't matter. You're somewhere. Where? Doesn't matter. You're looking for the exit. Why? 
well, so you don't get eaten by monsters. You roam corridors and can tilt your phone to perform various actions, such as looking around or reloading your gun, but all you're really doing is finding the exit and interacting with it to load the next level. There's mileage in a mobile Silent Hill game of this type, but what we got is a concept rather than a game. If this really were Doom, the frantic action and gory fun could translate nicely to a gyroscopic shooter. With Silent Hill, though, it's a poor fit. Aren't I supposed to be unnerved? Aren't I supposed to be working through the repressed memories and half-forgotten horrors of my character's past? Why am I just headshotting nurses and moving along like this is some kind of hunting trip? The Escape is a strange game, mainly because of how not strange it is. Silent Hill is supposed to be weird and grotesque. Perhaps it could be reimagined as a corridor shooter, but it's not reimagined here at all. It's just a name and some imagery plopped into a template. You can unlock the ability to play as an alien and as a Shiba Inu, but those should be nice bonuses rather than the absolute upper limit of the game's creativity. If the monsters and environments of Silent Hill are meant to represent something here in The Escape, they can only represent Konami's complete misunderstanding of what the series is. It's blood and rust and wobbly nurses, and if there were ever anything beyond that, Konami forgot what it was long ago. There's literally nothing beneath the surface. Surface. In a way, maybe it's best that Konami let the series die. They certainly couldn't remember why it was worth keeping alive. Number 12. Silent Hill The Arcade 2007 Arcade there is something fundamentally wrong with the very concept of Silent Hill the Arcade. And we don't mean the missing game at the end of its title, we mean the fact that it exists at all. Silent Hill as a series is defined by a number of things, and none of those things suit an arcade experience. That's not to say that spin-offs in general can't work, but it is to say that frantic light gun experiences aren't the way to go. Silent Hill is about grotesquery, it's about psychological disturbance, it's about lurking horror both all around you and inside of your brain. It's it's about pain and regret and lingering trauma. It's about nightmares from which one cannot awake. It's not, you'll notice, about shooting wave after wave of monsters. I know what you'll say, and you're right to say it. Resident Evil has its share of light gun spin-offs, and in our list of every Resident Evil game, we didn't complain about those. Well, okay, we did complain about those, but not about their fundamental right to exist. The thing is, though, that Resident Evil is more elastic. That's why you're sometimes solving puzzles in a mansion, sometimes being chased through a city by an unstoppable monster, and sometimes roundhouse-kicking Spanish gentlemen. Resident Evil can easily enough be boiled down to situations in which you are surrounded by the undead and need to fight your way out. In those moments, the game is indeed about the monsters. Silent Hill, though? Those games are never about the monsters. They are about what the monsters represent. If you want the monsters to matter, they can't be targets in a shooting gallery. If you don't want the monsters to matter, then I'm not sure why you'd call the game Silent Hill. But is the game any good? Well, it's okay. It's certainly not good enough to warrant a complete redefinition of what the series even is. There's a sad story at the core about a girl named Hannah and a sunken ship and some teenagers, but none of it feels like it has weight. How can it, when you're concentrating on racking up high scores and combos? As a light gun game, it's fine. As a Silent Hill game, it's an embarrassment. Number 11. Silent Hill Book of Memories 2012 Vita the final official Silent Hill game to be released, Book of Memories seems like it was intended to kill the series. Now let me be very clear about one thing, I'm not blaming developer WayForward for this. WayForward has developed a large number of great games, most notably the Shantae series, and has worked wonders with many other companies' IPs. DuckTales Remastered, Contra 4, Double Dragon Neon, uh, Barbie and the Three Musketeers? You get the point, anyway. WayForward is a developer whose competence has never been in doubt, and yet Book of Memories is thoroughly disappointing. What happened? Konami happened. WayForward received its marching orders thusly. They were to make a Silent Hill game that had little in common with traditional Silent Hill games. It was to have a top-down camera. It was to make use of as many of the Vita's features as possible. It was to be different each time you played it. Konami certainly had a long list of demands for a game they weren't interested in making themselves. 
At heart, Konami was looking for a game that would be engaging and replayable, but they didn't seem to realise that the best Silent Hill games were already engaging and replayable, and they managed to be those things without control gimmicks and roguelite elements. Silent Hill 2 wasn't different every time you played it, it was just a good game. Leave it to Konami to ask, how can we get fans to play Silent Hill over and over again, and answer the question with, make it nothing like Silent Hill. WayForward was fenced into designing a randomised dungeon crawler with a custom character, something that inherently works against Silent Hill's weaponization of one very specific character's very specific traumas. They created a room-by-room -room button masher, in which enemy hordes represented nothing other than obstacles to wear you down before you reach the dungeon's end. The game was received poorly, with its extremely slight story receiving specific criticism. Not only were fans getting something they didn't want in terms of gameplay, but they weren't getting what they wanted in terms of narrative or atmosphere either. WayForward was set up to fail. Could they have created a genuinely good Silent Hill game? It's possible, but we'll never know. All thanks to Konami. Number 10. Silent Hill Homecoming 2008 PlayStation 3, Xbox 360, and PC also the name of a dance to which nobody in their right mind wishes to be invited, Silent Hill Homecoming is an interesting attempt to evolve the franchise. Did it need to evolve? Well, that's up for debate, but Homecoming at least tries to do something different. And by that, I mean that it takes Silent Hill mostly out of Silent Hill. Homecoming mainly takes place in Shepard's Glen. The protagonist, Alex Shepard, is a combat veteran suffering from severe PTSD. Sort of. Look, we're trying to avoid spoilers, but that's the premise, so let's stick with that for the purposes of this list. He returns home after a discharge again, let's just stick with that, to find that his family is missing, with the exception of his catatonic mother. Does this have anything to do with the Spookums overflow from the neighbouring town of Silent Hill? It's impossible to know, until you've read the first two words in the game's title. This probably has something to do with Silent Hill. Again, trying so hard to avoid spoilers that I'm dangerously close to being at a loss for words, Silent Hill Homecoming tries to tell its own story, but ends up leaning too much on these stories of the first two games. Alex's struggles, once we learn what they are, are damningly similar to James Sunderland's in Silent Hill 2, and they're bolted on to a creepy child-sacrificing cult subplot that ties into the first game. Was there really a need for a sequel that did lesser imitations of two previous plotlines? You decide. Homecoming is also plagued by performance issues, pointless dialogue trees, and a near-complete lack of atmosphere. Gory things happen, yes, but very few effective things happen. The gameplay is among the weakest in the series, with a combo system that's almost always at complete odds with enemies' behaviour, and which often fails to work as intended. It also feels overlong and bloated, with a town that is more populated than ever before. And yes, Shepherd's Glen is allowed to be more populated than Silent Hill, that's fine, but my point is that the increase in the number of characters does not come with an increase in quality, and most of them could be cut out without sacrificing anything significant. They don't make the game scarier or better. In other words, they just make it longer. Number 9. Silent Hill Orphan 2007 Mobile Unlike the other Silent Hill trilogy for mobile phones, Silent Hill Orphan was designed and written from the ground up for the hardware. This is an innately good decision. Not only do you free yourself from trying to force a much larger, incompatible game onto a platform that doesn't easily support it, but you free yourself as well from the inevitable comparisons to the source material. Silent Hill Orphan, then, has an opportunity to actually find an identity for itself. The game was released in three parts, but again, it's less a game and two sequels than it is three chapters of a story. Each of the games focuses on a different character, but they overlap and interlock in a way that's quite interesting, and which provides new perspectives on experiences you've had in the other parts. The action plays out point-and-click adventure game style, which is a genre that's had a huge amount of classic entries, but relatively few horror-themed ones. Orphan handles it decently 
decently well and tells its story naturally and pretty effectively over the course of its brief chapters. That said, it's far from perfect, of course. The interface is fundamentally limited, with only a few commands, and everything from navigation to combat feels like it needs some serious refining. There's also a reliance on the pixel hunting and moon logic for which the genre had so often been derided. But there is a story here that's fittingly dark, even by Silent Hill standards. We won't spoil it, but Orphan centers around a massacre at Shepherd's Orphanage. Yes, a massacre at an orphanage, and that's only the beginning. Thirty years later, three survivors of that massacre, Ben, Moon, and Karen, find themselves forced to confront the tragedy and learn exactly what happened. It's a laugh a minute, as you might expect. No, in all seriousness, it's rough, gruesome stuff, tempered though it is by the limited graphics and clunky puzzles. Orphan is an admirably disturbing translation of the Silent Hill experience to phones, and it's actually the best of the handheld games in the entire series. That's not a high bar to clear, admittedly, but it is worth seeking out for fans of Silent Hill, or fans of absolute all-encompassing misery. I don't judge. They're basically the same thing anyway, right? Number 8. Silent Hill Downpour 2012 PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360. Silent Hill quickly became one of gaming's prestige franchises, but it almost as quickly fell into a rut of mediocrity and disappointment. Konami knew that they needed something truly special to restore the series to its place of former glory. And so they turned Silent Hill over to Vatra Games, who had made exactly one other game, and it was this. Oh dear. The same year Downpour released, Vatra Games closed up shop, content with having thrown their clump of dirt onto Silent Hill's coffin. And yet, of the games released after the series' heyday, Downpour does manage to be one of the better ones, go figure. We accompany an escaped convict on this particular stroll through Silent Hill. Now, given that even every men, or every women, seem to carry enough sadness and regret to populate the town with monsters galore as it is, a convicted lawbreaker provides particularly fertile mental territory, as you might imagine. But don't fret, there is sadness and regret as well. Well, your character's young son was forcibly drowned, and at the start of the game, you commit an act of brutal revenge upon the man you hold responsible. Revenge is a recurring theme, and a really great one for the town of Silent Hill to dig its claws into. It's one thing to see your emotional state reimagined as a set of monsters, but it's another to be reminded that you yourself willingly became one. However, the game was simply not very enjoyable, and the multiple endings were too easily telegraphed by on-screen button prompts, allowing you to be acutely aware of which path you were taking through the game. When a character is hanging by her fingernails, choosing the option to walk away doesn't have nearly the same weight as walking away yourself, and it's all too obvious when you'll be judged for your actions and when you won't. Additionally, respawning enemies, near-identical environments, and a lack of direction all make the town sequences feel aimless and, if we're going to be honest, pointless. The environments are repetitive and the performance issues embarrassingly pervasive. Additionally, the characters, particularly the nun and the radio DJ, are weird and quirky for the sake of weirdness and quirk. Whereas the previous games were effortlessly unnerving, Downpour works extremely hard to achieve the same effect, and that effect is then dulled by just how clearly the game is straining to do it. Number 7. Silent Hill Origins 2007 PlayStation Portable Early in development, Silent Hill Origins was meant to have a dark comedy tinge. Think Dead Rising, or actually, think the TV show Scrubs, which was cited as the inspiration. I wish I was joking, I really do. Thank the Lord, somebody realised Silent Hill and Scrubs have profoundly incompatible tones, but why that was even a consideration in the first place is beyond me. I think I speak for all Silent Hill fans when I say, no, I don't want no Scrubs. Sorry. I'm sure the game would have been Silent Hilarious, but I can't help but be glad that development turned sharply in the opposite direction. Fans instead got a leap back in time with an adventure that chronologically precedes Harry Mason's trip to the town. As tormented truck driver Travis, players get to meet younger versions of characters from that game and see how certain events transpired, such as Alessa's horrific burning. But 
that was previously framed as an accident, while it's now being shown as intentional. Indeed, much of what we see here is at odds with what we learned in the first game. Far from shedding light on those events, it provides a version of the backstory that is at odds with them. If the intention of Origins were to reveal to gamers that the first game had misled them about how things went down, well, that was always going to be met with resistance. More likely, though, the developers simply misinterpreted the first game, further reducing its value as a prequel. In terms of gameplay, Origins is significantly easier than most others, but that's not a bad thing, especially for those who enjoy Silent Hill stories more than they enjoy Silent Hill combat. What is bad is the introduction of quick time events, which have never been, and never will be, satisfying ways to fight. Origins tried to sell itself as a prequel, but it's one that neither suits nor benefits the story it's trying to tie itself into. Remove the prequel nonsense from the equation and you have a passable horror game with a protagonist who, like all of us, deserved better. Number 6. Silent Hill 4 The Room 2004 PlayStation 2, Xbox, and PC I'll say up front that Silent Hill 4 The Room is not about being stalked through Silent Hill by a ghostly Tommy Wiseau who keeps asking about your sex life, and we are all poorer for it. Instead, it's another game that doesn't take place in Silent Hill. You're in South Ashfield. The protagonist, Harry Townsend, travels to various hellish places, only a few of them even near Silent Hill. There have been conflicting stories about development, but Silent Hill 4 The Room was either intended to be an isolated spin-off or a completely unique horror game. Either way, there are very few strands that tie it into what we saw in previous games. In Silent Hill 2, James, not that one, can find the grave of Silent Hill 4 antagonist Walter Sullivan. In Silent Hill 3, Heather can read an article by Joseph Schreiber about the Hope House Orphanage, a character and location we learn more about here. That's pretty much it, really. Walter was not only a serial killer, but he has a ghostly connection to your apartment. Unless Henry can get to the bottom of a series of murders in which someone is continuing Walter's gruesome work, he'll never be able to escape. As you complete Henry's portrait of the serial killer, your apartment becomes more and more haunted, with the requisite Silent Hill awfulness bleeding into what was once your sanctuary. And we do mean bleeding. No figure of speech is too literal in these games. It's a cool concept, even if the game around it is quite shaky. The combat is clunky and the adventure is small, with many locations revisited in the second half of the game. Is that bad? Not necessarily, but it does mean that you've seen most of it by the time you're halfway through. Also, the end of Silent Hill 4 is one protracted escort mission, which locks you into a bad ending if your escortee takes too much damage, something you may not even realise until it's too late. Her AI isn't great either, and the length of the sequence means that even shouting, Come on Eileen! will lose its cathartic value long before it's over. Which is a shame, because that's a real really good joke. Number 5. PT 2014 PlayStation 4 Considering how important of a developer Konami is, and especially was, the company does an extraordinarily poor job of keeping their games playable. Case in point, if there is anything on this list that you'd like to try right now, there's a good chance that you can't play it on your current system. With PT, though, it's not due to the fact that the hardware evolves and Konami fails to re-release its games. Instead, it's because Konami actively decided to remove it from availability. PT stood for Playable Teaser, not Peter Tiny, and was a free download. But a teaser for what? At first, nobody was really sure. It was released by a company called 7780 Studio, which had made nothing else. Finishing the game revealed the truth, but doing so was not easy. The entire thing centers around an endlessly looping corridor, with imagery that grows more disturbing and puzzles that are inscrutable to the point that you won't be sure if you are making progress or just, quite literally, running in circles. Also, a dead lady keeps killing you. Fun for the whole family. The solution is far from straightforward, with you at various points needing to speak into the PS4 controller's microphone, do literally nothing, and trigger the laughter of babies. But only after enough time has passed for any of this to matter. The ultimate reward? The reveal that it's a teaser for Silent Hills, a new game involving Hideo Kojima, Guillermo del Toro, and Norman Reedus. Good lord! With a team like that, you couldn't possibly make a game that would split the gaming community down the middle? Oh. Oh. The point is, PT was the promise of new life being breathed into a franchise that, as this list demonstrates quite clearly, desperately needed it. Then, Konami and Kojima had a very public falling out, and we never saw anything more of Silent Hills. We don't even know how much the events and characters of PT would have to do with the full game, though it's safe to say that Norman Reedus would have stuck around, otherwise the man earned one extremely easy paycheck for walking down the street. PT isn't a full game. It was never for sale. You can't play it legally anymore 
anymore. And yet it was so good, so well done, and so well crafted that it rockets this far up the list. Now, imagine if they had actually made the game. Number 4. Silent Hill Shattered Memories, 2009. Wii. Hands up everyone who expected one of the best Silent Hill games to be on the Wii. Okay, now waggle those hands around! That's what you wee people like doing, right? Listen, we know how strange it might sound to recommend playing Silent Hill on the Wii. It's like recommending playing Postal on a leapfrog. But Shattered Memories benefits from the unique features of the hardware. Fiddling with the Wii Remote is a reasonable way to make it feel like you're fiddling with Harry Mason's mobile phone. And the IR sensor lets you shine your torch around more precisely so that when it illuminates something hideous, you'll only have yourself to blame. It's great! Shattered Memories is a remake of the first game, except that it isn't really. It's more of a reimagining, except that's not quite accurate either. Or maybe it's too accurate. It's difficult to speak too much about this game without getting into spoilers, so if you know, you know. And if you don't know, I've confused you. You're welcome. Developer Climax Studios, after impressing Konami with their work on Silent Hill Origins, pitched a game called Silent Hill Cold Heart. It involved a young girl struggling with depression, a dangerously cold environment, a psychological profiling system, and periodic evaluations from a therapist. If you've played Shattered Memories, you know just how much of that game made it into this game, and if you haven't, you probably didn't notice that I slipped you a little clue. That framework was used to create another perspective on the events of the first game, a perspective which could, indeed, shatter into various narrative splits depending upon choices the player makes. It's a messy game, and its psychological profiling is better in concept than in execution, but it's one of the most emotionally effective entries in the series. It's an experience as worth having for those who played the first game as those who didn't. It provides a place for both these groups to come together, a cold, dark, lonely place where things are rarely the same the next time you look at them. Number 3. Silent Hill 1999 PlayStation there are some who feel that the low-poly, jagged grime of the original game set a standard for atmosphere that no other game in the series has been able to match. They may look better or be more overtly horrific, but none of them quite managed to unnerve in quite the same way as a jittery early 3D PlayStation game could. People still intentionally develop in this style to this day. We understand the appeal, and there's no denying that, as clunky as the first Silent Hill can often be, it still retains its capacity to disturb. It also does something that the sequels never really tried to do again. In those games, the town of Silent Hill is a personalised, tailor-made hell for our protagonists. In this first game, however, we control Harry Mason, a man seeking his missing daughter. He isn't working through any trauma, he isn't fighting repressed memories, and he isn't battling manifestations of his personal demons. Instead, Silent Hill in this game is taking its spooky cues from a different character entirely. A lesser. We control Harry, but the story doesn't really belong to him. He's an interloper who really has no business here, and his only goal is to find his kid and scram. Alessa is a child who's been chosen by a cult to serve as the vessel for their god, and we're talking Rosemary's Baby style. She's not opening a portal or summoning a demon, she's being impregnated and forced to birth it. The ritual goes wrong. Good news all round, really except that Alessa's psychic powers activate in the chaos, and she's horribly burned as a result. Trapped between life and death, suffering immense physical and emotional torment, with the cult not allowing her to die, her personal hell is being brought to life in Silent Hill. The voice acting, the writing, the primitive 3D visuals, the fog that was a mechanical necessity to save on rendering distant objects, everything that could have been seen as a drawback works in tandem here to create a memorable world that operates on the logic of nightmares. Even if there were no combat and no danger, and the entire game were just a walking sim through this world of decay, Silent Hill 1 would retain its ability to haunt. The setting is perfectly realised, owing, ironically, to its imperfections. Number 2. Silent Hill 2 2001 PlayStation 2 like Resident Evil before it, Silent Hill was embraced both commercially and critically as a truly important work of horror. And like Resident Evil, Silent Hill and its first sequel did more than just double down on what worked the first time around. They both expanded their scopes and focused on new characters. They retained the chilling atmosphere, haunting visuals, and repulsive monsters 
monsters, but otherwise crafted an experience that was unique enough to stand on its own. Silent Hill 2 was also the first and far from last time that Silent Hill itself would change to specifically torment its visitors. And we do mean visitors plural. We control James Sunderland, but we also meet Angela and Eddie, two other travellers working through hells of their own. Silent Hill demonstrates its ability to be many things to many people, and for better or worse, that became its defining characteristic in the games to come. The previous game did a fair job of worming its way into players' psyches, but Silent Hill 2 takes that as its central focus, truly earning the label psychological horror. Here, the town turns our protagonist into its plaything helping Silent Hill 2 stand out from its predecessor. And it's not this game's fault that later games would rob this one of its unique approach. Then, of course, there's Pyramid Head, Silent Hill 2's most important contribution to the pop culture canon. And once again, it's not this game's fault that later sequels dulled his impact by either creating similar monsters in his image, or plopping him wholesale into their worlds, despite the fact he was very specifically created by James Sunderland's inner turmoil, and by the rules of this world, shouldn't have turned up anywhere else. The game is emotionally upsetting and genuinely terrifying by turns, with a surprisingly mature story about loss, regret, and guilt at its core. It's a remarkable achievement for a game of its era, and for many, it's the peak of the series as a whole. We see exactly why. We disagree, but not by much. It was a close race, with the winner just barely being… Number 1. Silent Hill 3 2003 PlayStation 2. We're giving Silent Hill 3 the nod for one particular reason, Heather Mason. Our protagonist in this game is the best in the series, and she connects us to the town in a way that we haven't been connected in previous games. Silent Hill obstructed Harry, it toyed with James, but Heather is at the very heart of the events here. The game picks up the plot of the first entry, but retains the intense psychological torment of the second. Far from being an excuse to tread old ground, Silent Hill 3 instead pulls from the best of both of those games, presenting familiar concepts in ways that challenge our preconceptions. The least spoilery thing we can say is that Heather is Harry Mason's daughter, and Harry did the thing any sane human being would do after leaving Silent Hill. He moved as far from that hellhole as it was possible to get. But the events of Silent Hill 3 see Heather journeying to the town for reasons of her own. Or is she journeying back to the town? The gradually revealed mystery of Heather's connection to Silent Hill dovetails nicely with a teenager's natural questioning of her own identity and what she's meant to do with her life. The fact that the town of Silent Hill has any kind of role in Heather's coming-of-age story suggests that it's going to be an even more difficult journey for her than it already is for most people. Heather is gradually learning how the world works, and then she's thrust into also having to learn how Silent Hill works. That's a wonderful, horrifying complication, and the game handles it marvellously. To go along with our favourite protagonist, we have our favourite take on the combat, which is more challenging now, but not overcomplicated or overemphasised the way it would become. Ditto the exploration, which manages to feel just a bit more open and better designed than the previous games. It rarely feels like you're being moved forward across a linear path, even when that's exactly what's happening. Also, the game looks positively stunning for the PS2, retaining all of the gruesome charm of the previous titles without losing anything by bringing it into sharper focus. It builds upon what came before without diluting or distracting from what made the prior two games so effective. Whichever of the three you personally prefer, it's difficult to argue that Silent Hill 3 isn't a perfect end to the trilogy. It should probably also have been the end to the series. Not that Silent Hill had to stop there, but having seen everything that comes next, we all would have been better off if Konami had let the series rest in peace. At least we aren't likely to see them desecrate this corpse again anytime soon.